you very much for the invitation. Uh, I hope people can hear me and also uh, right, see my slides. So I will talk about the purity conjecture of Nisnevich, uh, indeed for torsors. Um, so uh, this is a paper on archive. Uh, so if you want to just go to archive and look up at the paper, here is the reference. And actually these slides you can also download from uh, my web page. I just uh, posted them there. Um, so if you prefer to have them locally, uh, you can um, go there. Um, okay, so the plan, I will formulate the conjecture, obviously. Uh, I will explain the proof of the conjecture, um, at least in some details. Uh, then I will discuss the abstract formulation uh, of this conjecture and the gross and Dixier conjecture. Um, and then I will talk about the counterexamples because the Nisnevich purity conjecture is not valid uh, in the form it was formulated. Okay, so first of all, let me recall the uh, gross and Dixier conjecture. Uh, so R is a regular semi-local integral domain. Uh, G is a reductive group scheme over R. Uh, e is a G torsor and the conjecture predicts that if uh, E is rationally trivial, if it has a rational section, then E is trivial. I'm pretty much sure all of you have seen this before, so I don't need to spend much time talking about this. Let me just recall the, uh, let me tell you briefly what is known uh, without the names, unfortunately. Uh, so it's known if dimension of R is one, it's relatively easy. It's known if G is a torus. Uh, it's known in the geometric case, uh, that is when R contains a field. And in the mixed characteristic case, uh, beyond one dimensional and the toric case, uh, it is known if R is unramified over DVR, right? So kind of the central fiber of R is uh, regular and uh, G is quasi-split, right? So that's what's known now. Um, I will, today I will fully uh, focus on the geometric case, right? So we will be always assuming that R contains a field. Um, any questions so far? Okay, so now let me formulate the Nisnevich conjecture. So it starts the same way as the gross and Dixier conjecture, but you also have a function f on R, so an element of R, uh, with the property that this element is not in the square of any maximal ideals, right? We have only finitely many maximal ideals because R is semi-local. Um, in other words, uh, the hypersurface given by the equation f equals zero is regular. Uh, and now I start with a torsor over RF, right? So it's not defined on spec R, it's defined away from the hypersurface. And the claim is the same. So it, it is trivial if it is generically trivial. So um, let, me know, let me tell you, what is known, actually very little was known previously. So it was known for GLN, at least in the geometric case. Um, so in the GLN, torsor suggests vector bundles or, uh, well, uh, there is a way to go between torsors and vector bundles. So just saying that a vector bundle by the way, every vector bundle is automatically generically trivial. Um, so it's just saying that the vector bundle is trivial. Um, so every vector bundle is trivial uh, on RF. Uh, and that's, well, the gross index here conjecture would be totally trivial in this case because uh, every vector, well, yes. Uh, well, not totally trivial, but very easy, but uh, 
Nisnevich conjecture is not trivial even in this case. It's actually known as a conjecture of Quillen. It was proved by Hatvadikar and Rao in 1983, um, assuming that actually air is smooth over a field, in particular of finite type. Uh, but then Papiescu, using his technique, uh, extended it to the case when R just contains a field. Um, Yes, so R has to be local rather than semi-local, but I think this is this was just, you know, because it's how people formulated it. Uh, and this is known when dimension is one, but in this case, it just reduces to gross index here. And finally, uh, well, Nisnevich formulated it in 1989 in his paper on gross index here, actually. Uh, and he proved that when R is local of dimension two under some additional assumptions. So that is what was known. Any questions so far? Okay, so right, we are, we are going to see that it's actually false unless uh, G satisfies an isotropy condition. And actually now I'm going to exactly uh, tell you what isotropy condition. So suppose I have a semi-simple group scheme uh, then you have the, uh, well, over any connected scheme U. Um, then you have the adjoint group scheme, of course. And the adjoint group scheme can be written as a product. Um, of uh, schemes that cannot be further factored. In fact, each of those GI would be a um, a, a veil restriction of a simple group scheme or, or via some um, et al. Um, morphism. Uh, and these factors GI, of course, uh, are uniquely defined by G up to isomorphism. So now the, right. And now I need to recall that the semi-simple group is called isotropic if it contains a non-trivial split torus, essentially contains GM. Uh, if S is connected and semi-local, then it is isotropic if and only if it contains a proper parabolic subgroup scheme. Uh, actually, some people told me that it's true uh, if S is a fine, uh, but I don't know of a reference. Uh, anyways, I'm just happy with connected and semi-local S. Uh, and now I give a definition. So I say that a semi-simple U-group scheme G is strongly locally isotropic if each factor uh, is isotropic the risky locally over U. Right, so you can show that it's equivalent to um, G uh, having kind of a large, not, so not large, small parabolic group, subgroup scheme. Uh, small in the sense that it remains non-trivial in every uh, quotient of G in every non-trivial quotient of G. Um, so, right, this is a definition I gave in my paper on gross index here in this generalization, uh, generalizations. Um, and also, well, the reason actually, one of the reasons for this definition is the following theory. Um, which actually also starts like uh, gross index here. But this time I multiply R by uh, a K algebra. So if you wish, I'm looking at a constant family over spec R. And the claim is that the principal bundle over this constant family or torsor uh, is trivial. Uh, it's enough to check over the generic point. Oh, sorry, for some reason, yes. So the restriction of this E to the uh, generic fiber of this family is uh, trivial, then uh, G is trivial, uh, then E is trivial. But for this, you really need uh, GA to be strongly localized. Uh, otherwise, it's just not true. So this was proved by 
Panin, Stavrova, and Vavilov under some mild assumptions uh, on, I guess, for infinite K uh, and uh, also assuming that G is simple. So in a sense, my uh, input is not very deep here. Any questions so far? Okay, so now I can uh, formulate um, gross index, sorry, Nisnevich's theorem. Well, not Nisnevich's theorem, actually, it's my theorem, sorry. Um, uh, so this is a partial a proof of uh, gross index, of uh, Nisnevich's conjecture. Right, so it's exactly the, well, so there are the following assumptions. So first of all, I have some assumption on K. Yeah, some people don't believe that I actually need it, but uh, I was not able to get rid of this. So I either have to assume that the field is infinite, or I need to assume that spec R has uh, a K rational point, right? So the inclusion has an inverse. Uh, but probably that's not needed. Uh, the second assumption is needed, that G R is strongly locally isotropic. Uh, and then we have the uh, statement. Any questions about that? Yes, so uh, I'm going to briefly explain the proof. Um, and uh, the first step is, of course, uh, you can apply this Papiescu theorem. You write R uh, is the limit of um, schemes of this type. So the limit of rings of this type where X is smooth over K, in particular, X is of finite type. And OXX is just a semi-local ring of finitely many closed points. So you reduce to this case. You can also assume that G is defined over X. And you can also assume that the function F also is a function on X. And then the first reduction is the following that in this case, you can somehow lift it uh, to a family of affine lines, right? So in the situation of the theorem, uh, you are looking at um, AR1, a fine line over R, and then uh, there are two subschemes in AR1, so what's important is that these subschemes uh, are finite over the base. Uh, and then I have a principal bundle uh, defined away from Y uh, and trivial away from, so it's defined away from something finite and et al over the base. It's trivial away from something finite over the base. Uh, and, uh, the condition, of course, on this E prime is that actually, if you pull back along a certain section, then um, you get the original uh, principal, original torsor E. Uh, so, of course, uh, having this proposition, uh, I only need to show that every that this E prime uh, is going to be trivial. So, the proof of this proposition is pretty standard. It goes exactly the same as strategy as the proof of gross index here conjecture. And uh, probably I will not uh, talk about it unless uh, there is any strong request. Um, but uh, this technique was well known uh, already for many, many years. Uh, different parts of this of uh, this have shaped recently for example um, it was just recently uh, found by Ivan Panin how to extend it to the case when k is a finite field but anyways uh, by now this is standard technique well of course there are minor uh, difficulties uh, because of this y right because there is y is empty in the gross index here case um, and there is no f, or in other words, f is equal to one, uh, but they're not difficult. And 
So the main ingredient is the following, the second part, saying that in this situation, um, this E prime, which is now remained renamed to E, is actually trivial. So if you have a, a G bundle, a principal torsor, sorry, a G torsor over uh, AR1 uh, minus Y, uh, if it's trivial away from Z, then it is actually trivial. And that's what I'm going to explain in the next maybe 15 minutes. Are there any questions so far? So is the isotropic condition only used in this last part? Yes, it will be used on the next slide uh, because the first case of this proposition is when y is actually constant over r. And in this case, uh, the statement just follows from the growth index here for families. Because in this case, a1 minus y is a constant family over r. So by growth index here for families, I just need to check the statement at the generic point. And at the generic point, it is well known. Uh, it follows from uh, a result of Gil, uh, Philip Gil, who is here. Uh, and um, I think it goes uh, back to a technique of uh, Ragunat and Ramanat. Um, but to be able to apply growth index here for families, I need uh, this adjoint uh, group scheme to be strongly locally isotropic. So that's the first step. Any questions about this? Okay, so the second step. Uh, but before I go to the second step, I want to recall the notion of ele elementary distinguished square. Um, it will come up a couple times today. So suppose I have a Cartesian diagram where the uh, horizontal arrows are open embeddings and vertical arrows are et al. And the complements are isomorphic. So P induces an isomorphism between complements where I just equip complements with uh, reduced scheme structures. Uh, this is called an elementary distinguished square. And what's important for us is that you can glue um, torsors over elementary distinguished square. So if you have a torsor over U and a torsor over V and an isomorphism uh, of their pullbacks to, to this, then you can, uh, you get a torsor over X. Uh, okay, so now I get to the case two of my uh, proposition. I am assuming this time that Y is not constant over uh, the base but still decomposes into the union of uh, connected components such that each connected component is, uh, well, constant over the base, projects isomorphically to the base. Uh, so it's a slight generalization of the first case. Um, and actually this is where I'm using the assumption on the field. because my assumption on the field actually tells me that the number of these components uh, is at most the cardinality of K. It's trivial if K is infinite uh, and it follows from the existence of the splitting uh, if K is fine. And so I can take some distinct elements of K. And then the idea is that I'm going to straighten my Y, uh, right? So I'm just, claiming that I have a closed embedding of the whole Z, in fact, even of the infinitesimal neighborhood of a second, of the second infinitesimal neighborhood of Z, uh, such that YI just goes to uh, the constant subscheme. Uh, all right. And in this case, I get an elementary distinguished square. Uh, so I, I pick uh, is a risky neighborhood of Z. Uh, and I get the following uh, distinguished square. 
but now I can use this distinguished square to descend E. Or so more in, which sense, in which sense is that square distinguished? Uh, in the sense of the previous slide. Right, that uh, the, again, the uh, horizontal maps are open embedded. First of all, it's a Cartesian diagram. Uh, the horizontal maps are open embeddings. The vertical morphisms are et al. Uh, and the diagram induces isomorphism between the complements, between, uh, between Z minus Y uh, and uh, Z prime minus Y naught times spec R. Uh, so, right, so what, what am I gluing? I'm just taking um, I guess the restriction of E here. I restrict E to W minus Y. And here I just take the trivial bond, trivial torsor. Uh, they are both trivial on W minus Z by assumption, so I can glue them and get a certain torsor on um, AR1 minus Y0 times spec R. But now I'm in the first case, so I see that E prime is also trivial. And uh, this is very nice. Uh, well, but, right, but if E prime is trivial, of course, this means that this one is also trivial, right? Because it's the pullback of E prime. And this means that actually my E is trivial in the neighborhood of Y, right? So I can extend it to Y by just gluing with a trivial torsor in the Zariski topology. Uh, so it means I can extend my E to AR1. And then I again in the case one, in the case one with Y being empty. So that's how you take care of case two. So of course there is a slight technical, um, well, uh, difficulty in proving this um, existence of this Yota, but other than that, I have explained what's going on. Any questions about that? Okay, and finally, the general case. So uh, the general case is by induction. I am defining certain invariant. Uh, which I call D, and this is the difference between degree and the number of connected components. So in other, in other ways, um, in other words, for every connected component, uh, I define D to be just degree minus one, and then I add up these numbers. So if this invariant is zero, it means every component is of degree one over the base, and this is exactly case two. So I just need to prove the induction step. Right, so um, since D is greater than zero, I have a connected component of Y of degree at least two, call it V. And now I pull back the whole picture along uh, V. All right. And um, of course I have uh, diagonal component in beta in y prime. And this tells me that uh, the degree d of y prime over v is less than d of y over spec r. Because the degree is the same, but you get an extra connected component. Right? Um, v was connected over, um, v was connected, but its pullback is disconnected. Um, so by the induction hypothesis, E prime is trivial. And now again, I'm constructing some uh, distinguished square. So uh, speaking in, sim in simple terms, I just see, well, since E prime is trivial, it's trivial in the neighborhood of delta. Uh, but this means that um, my original uh, torsor was also trivial in the neighborhood of delta. Sorry, not in the, in the neighborhood of V. 
right? Because delta is isomorphic to V. Uh, so it means I can actually extend my torsor uh, to, a, to a neighborhood of V, right? So now I get a torsor over AR1 minus a smaller um, subscheme. And again, uh, the induction completes the proof. Any questions about that? Okay, so that's actually right, the end of the proof of uh, uh, the Misnevich uh, purity conjecture uh, under some assumptions. And actually, uh, now I want to talk about something which um, Sierra asked me some 10 years ago, well, almost 10 years ago, actually, maybe maybe nine years ago, um, when I was giving a talk at Arsay. Uh, and the question is, is it possible to formulate the properties of torsors uh, which I used, right? So is there any abstract version of uh, this argument? So is it possible if you wish to separate uh, algebraic group theory from geometry? And the answer is yes, so maybe it's not the final answer. So I will explain uh, the abstract version maybe in the next uh, 15 minutes. So, uh, and the first point is that you really, maybe it's the most subtle point is to decide which category you use, right? So this is my choice. I am starting with an Assyrian scheme X. Um, and I am working with uh, essentially smooth over AX schemes. So for me, essentially smooth means that it is a filtered inverse limit of smooth schemes where transition morphisms are open affine embeddings. Some other people use the different notion of essentially smooth. For example, I saw uh, at some papers that um, etal embeddings were, etal morphisms were allowed. But in my case, it will be just open affine embeddings. And um, I have uh, the category of um, essentially smooth over X schemes. I emphasize that the morphisms in this category are arbitrary X morphisms, right? So morphisms are not required to be essentially smooth, but the objects are essentially smooth over X. And of course, the reason I need this is the following example. Uh, if I have any affine scheme and any finite set of um, closed, actually schematic points, uh, I can look at the semi-local ring of X and its spectrum is uh, essentially smooth over X. Any questions about this slide? Okay, now a little Liam is saying that uh, composition of essentially smooth morphisms is essentially smooth and the base change of an essentially smooth morphism is essentially smooth. Second part is almost obvious. The first part uh, requires a bit of uh, yoga with limits. Now I'm going to give a definition so I'm recording the notion of elementary distinguished square. And here is the definition. So suppose I have uh, a pre-sheaf of pointed sets on uh, this uh, category of essentially smooth schemes over X. Uh, then I say that it's Nisnevich semi-sheaf of pointed sets if you can glue over elementary distinguished squares. So this map is surjective, right? semi shift because I do not require this map to be injective. And of course, uh, requiring this to be injective would kill torsors, right? Because uh, locally free torsor uh, is not, locally trivial torsor is not necessarily trivial, but you can glue. Again, uh, I'm not sure that semi shift is the best possible term. I was not able to come with anything better. 
Um, any questions about this definition? Yes, of course, the main example is that first non-abelian cohomology uh, with respect to um, any reasonable group G uh, form uh, in this a semi sheaf of pointed sets, pointed by trivial torsors. Now I'm going to formulate, first I'm formulated the properties under which F satisfies uh, some sort of gross and Dixier type statement. First, it must commute with uh, filtered inverse limits. Second, I should have the so-called section property, well, so-called again, maybe people will come up with a better name, uh, so here is the property. If I have um, an object um, of my F over uh, an affine line, uh, which restricts to the point, to the trivial object away from Z, right? I'm then actually I'm claiming that for every section of the projection, uh, the uh, pullback of my object is again a point. So maybe I should emphasize that actually if k is infinite, then the section property follows from a homotopy invariance of my functor. So uh, the way to think about the section property is a kind of a weak version of uh, homotopy invariance. And in fact, when uh, Ivan Panin and I uh, proved gross and Dixier uh, over uh, infinite fields, uh, formulating this property was probably the most uh, difficult part of the proof just uh, because people tried to prove homotopy invariance of um, torsors and homotopy invariance of torsors uh, actually fails. So it's a kind of a replacement of homotopy invariance. Any questions about this? Okay, and finally, I have a property uh, which is some people would know uh, under the name of uh, equating groups. Uh, so essentially it says that uh, group schemes are locally, uh, reductive group schemes are locally constant. Uh, so here is a precise statement. It's a little long. So I start with any semi-local case scheme. Um, I should have said that actually this semi-local scheme is, uh, is uh, right, okay, sorry, no, everything is correct. So I have a, a fine integral semi-local scheme, K scheme where K is my field, uh, some technical assumption on it. Uh, and I have two morphisms from W to X. These two morphisms are required to be essentially smooth. Now you, um, is a closed subscheme such that if you restrict P1 and P2 to U, then uh, the morphism is again is essentially smooth and actually get the same morphism. Uh, and then the condition is that there should be some equating morphism uh, with a section over U such that if you pull back. Uh, the functor uh, along the composition, uh, then you get the same functors. Now, um, what does it mean in down to earth terms? So in down to earth terms, it means that if you have any third morphism from T to W prime, uh, which is also required to be essentially smooth, uh, then, uh, in principle, we have two different sets. 
because T has two different structures of uh, X scheme. Uh, and you have to be given a bijection between these two sets. And moreover, this bijection has to be somehow restricting to the identity over U in the following sense. Um, well, maybe I will not go into details, but uh, the point is that uh, you can restrict to uh, U. And in fact, when you restrict, you see that these two morphisms are actually equal by uh, some assumptions. So these two sets are just the same. Uh, and this diagram has to compute. So this uh, isomorphism has to be compatible with uh, this identity. So this is the local triviality state. Any questions about that? So this should this isomorphism be functorial in some sense? Well, uh, I guess, yes, it has to be functorial uh, on the previous slide. Let's see. Uh, yes, I'm saying compatible bijection. So I, I already want it to be factorial in the sense that if I have some uh, T prime to T, then some diagram will commute. That's a little bit more than saying that it is functorial. Right, it's saying that, uh, well, essentially what it says here is that it restricts to the identity on you. Any more questions? Okay. Yes, so. Uh, Right. And well, now, of course, we have a theorem is pretty much what you expect, uh, though maybe a little bit weaker, because I am starting uh, already from a functor defined on um, some prime over X. Uh, which means that uh, if I want to prove gross index here, uh, to derive gross index here from this theorem, I need first to extend uh, G to a group scheme defined over something of finite type. Um, so I first have to apply Papiasco theorem to replace R with uh, a local ring, um, semi-local ring of some points uh, on a smooth scheme, and I have to extend G. Uh, because otherwise the theorem would be more complicated, I would also have to assume that the functor itself can be approximated by uh, kind of things living on the finite type schemes. So um, the scheme is formula anyway. So the theorem is formulated uh, in this way. You start with uh, a group scheme defined uh, on a smooth uh, scheme. Um, right. So once more, if you want to derive gross index here, you have to uh, use Papiasco theorem uh, to approximate. Any questions about this theorem? Yes, I have to say that, well, I guess I will say it in a second. Uh, that it goes back to Coyote land. And maybe this is, uh, I guess this is the reason why uh, Sierra asked this question uh, because uh, Kaliotti, Lena, and Nahenburin proved gross index here in the case when G uh, comes from an infinite field, when the field is infinite and G comes from the field. And in this case, uh, they essentially proved it for any functor, which is homotopy invariant and commutes with. Uh, in a semi shift, which is homotopy invariant and commutes with limits. But um, uh, right, so of course they didn't have to equate the scheme because it was already coming from the field. 
and they didn't need section property because in their case, uh, they already had homotopy invariants. Okay, so, uh, right. So if you want gross index here for family, you need to make uh, the section property slightly more, slightly stronger. You actually have to write the sections property for families. And that's how it's written. So you have it, an additional y, which is essentially smooth over k. Uh, and then uh, you start with an object not over eu1, but eu1 uh, times y. Uh, and yes, in this case, you get some sort of a family version of gross index here for uh, semi sheets. And finally, I'll tell you the uh, one more axiom you need to uh, get Nisnevich's conjecture. It's very simple. It's essentially some sort of uh, Ragunathan Ramanathan property, or maybe I should say, uh, Gilles Ragunathan Ramanathan property. Uh, because my reference is certainly paper of Jira. I don't know if it was not known by to, uh, Ragunathan and Ramanathan. But the property essentially is saying that if you have uh, an object of a fine line, uh, which is uh, generically trivial, then it is trivial. And then again, the statement that you get uh, this conjecture. Uh, the abstract version of Nisnevich purity conjecture. I have a question now. So do I end in 10, uh, in five or in 15 minutes? Uh, in uh, in 10 or well, between 10 and 15. <laughs> okay, this is another 15. So let me now explain, maybe geometrically it's the most interesting part, uh, why uh, Nisnevich purity conjecture is not true in general. Uh, and the point is actually, there are some torsors over affine lines that cannot be uh, extended to the projective lines. And this contradicts Nisnevich's conjecture because if it was, uh, this means that, okay, so if Nisnevich conjecture was true in full generality, such a torsor would be trivial in the, in the neighborhood of the infinity divisor. And then of course you can extend it to the infinity divisor. So this theorem is derived from the following proposition, uh, which is a little bit more uh, just precise version. So I start with any integral Nasserian normal local ring, uh, other than a field. Uh, and I assume for simplicity that contains an infinite field. Uh, and then I find a group scheme, uh, which is semi-simple uh, and anisotropic over the fraction field of B. So it's anisotropic uh, generically. So in my paper, uh, Exotic Principle Bundles, I gave an example of such group scheme. Uh, but I'm sure there are lots of examples and lots of ways to uh, construct such group schemes. And then the claim is that there is a maximal ideal in B of T, right? It corresponds, of course, to a closed point uh, in uh, A1, uh, A1B. Uh, and then there is. Um, a G torsor over this, uh, which is uh, which cannot be extended to pi to p one. So then I'm just applying this proposition to uh, R equal to uh, B of T to localization of B of T at M, and I get the theorem. So how is this proposition proved? Uh, this goes uh, uh, in a few steps. So first of all, my group scheme trivializes over some uh, finite total extension of B prime of B. Uh, then also I get, uh, I can construct a closed embedding of G into uh, AB1. 
uh, using the fact that B is local. And I guess I also need that uh, the field is, is infinite here. Now it's a little bit more interesting. So uh, recall that we can associate to every group scheme, we can, as can associate it's a fine Grassmannian. Um, and I can look at morphisms from A, B prime one uh, to the fine Grassmannian of the uh, trivialized group. And it, well, it's easy to see that it actually parameterizes the following pairs a principal bundle over this product, a G torsor over this product, trivialized away from spec B prime. Um, right, so you have to uh, jiggle a little bit with uh, fiber products to see this, but it's, it's very easy. Essentially, the idea is that Grassmannian parameterizes extensions um, to a divisor. So this would parameterize just extensions of the trivial bundle uh, to A B prime one. Uh, and that's exactly uh, the complement you have here. Right, so that's why uh, this is true. Okay, so the next step, I'm constructing a morphism from A B prime one to Grassmannian of G that cannot be extended to B P B prime one. Uh, it's certainly very believable because A B prime one is uh, at least two dimensional and there is no reason why a morphism from a two dimensional scheme would extend uh, to a divisor, right? In the one dimensional case, it would extend because Grassmannian is uh, int proper, but in two dimensional, uh, two -dimensional uh, case, you have things like X divided by Y. Uh, so yes, and now we use the previous bijection to get a G torsor over AK1 times PB1 uh, with a trivialization away from spec B prime. Now, uh, since uh, my morphism cannot be extended to PB, PB prime one. You cannot extend this torsor to um, PK one times PB one uh, together with a trivialization. With a trivialization. And now I claim that, well, this is too global an object, right? So I need um, to select a certain closed point. Uh, in uh, spec B of T, sorry, in PB1, such that if I restrict to the uh, local ring of this closed point, I still get uh, a torsor which does not extend to the projective line. Um, right, so for this, I will find some maximal ideal in B of T. It gives me a point in AB1, but uh, AB1 is inside PB1. So it's how I get a point, a closed point inside PB1. Uh, so why can I uh, find such a maximal ideal? Why can I find such a closed point? And the reason for this is the following proposition, which is my last slide. Um, so it's a general statement. So uh, suppose I have any reasonable scheme and a semi-simple group scheme, which is generically anisotropic. And suppose I have a generically trivial torsor over A1 times X. Um, then the claim is that it can be extended to P1 cross X, if and only if this can be done locally over X. Right, so you really need to check it only uh, locally. Um, and uh, if such extension exists, this is unique, it is unique. So in a sense, first part follows from the second. Uh, so the second part 
it actually follows from the sec from the point that affine Grassmannians of anisotropic group schemes do not have sections, right? So if I had two different extensions, it would give me a section of the affine Grassmannian. But affine Grassmannians, as I explained in this uh, exotic paper, uh, do not have uh, sections. Uh, if the group skip is anisotropic. And the first part follows from the second, essentially, because if you can do something locally, but this extension is unique, then you can glue uh, the extensions. And finally, this implies, this completes the last step. Uh, for the following reason, because, uh, well, you just apply um, this proposition with x being uh, pb1. So you find the point of pb1 such that uh, you cannot extend even in the neighborhood of this point. Okay, so that's actually all I wanted to tell you today. That's uh, it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there any question? Any question? So I, I do have a question. So um, coming back to this counter example, so what's the smallest explicit uh, sort of, can you write it down this? Mm. Um, what's the smallest explicit situation? So I think the smallest explicit G it's exactly as in my um, papers, this simplest explicit I know is spin seven. So, so G is a form of spin seven, strongly inner form of spin seven. And uh, for B, it's kind of clear from this proposition, right? So uh, for R, so you should take any Nasirian normal local ring that is not a field. So, for example, you can take um, well localization of um, k c of t at zero, uh, and then you have to go one dimension above, uh, right? So you have to uh, take this r to be a localization of uh, so R will be two-dimensional, localization of a two-dimensional thing, you can just localize uh, K of X, Y, right? Uh, two-dimensional polynomial ring. But strictly speaking for the Nisnevich, you go, have to go one more uh, dimension up, right? So it has to be a localization of uh, polynom the polynomial ring in three variables. Uh, did I answer your question? Yeah. But well, okay. What <laughs> any other question? No, I have a comment uh, about the beginning. You know, you remember about uh, the fact that isotropic, isotropic is is the same thing that uh, admitting a proper parabolic subgroup over mm -hmm. over an affine base. Okay, mm -hmm. so so this is my question. <laughs> I see. Okay, okay, so I will send you the reference to that. Okay, thank you very much. Private job. Okay, but you know it can be useful time to time. I see. And also, uh, no, about, about the Snisnevich conjecture, I mean, there, there, there were no other cases at all known about, I mean, I'm thinking about PGLN, Brewer groups, or you, where we have more, you know, tools. So, so say it again, so your question so is- So for example, if you take PGLN, okay? Mm -hmm. so, uh, so there is a strong relation between, you know, uh, etal cohomology of PGLN and Brewer, Brewer Cottendig group, okay? And mm -hmm. so for Brewer group, we, we, I mean, we have some knowledge about that. Uh, I mean, wh wh was this not known in this case, for example, for, for PGLN or for? You mean the counter example, right? No, 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 no. The, the, the statement. The I mean, the, yes, maybe some, yes, some partial statements for certain groups. Uh, yes, I'm thinking about PGLN because it, or uh, you can maybe quadratic forms, uh, I don't know. There was no, because on the cross-injective conjecture, uh, I mean, on the cell injectivity, 
there are uh, this I mean the classical cases of right. PGLA or, right. or quadratic forms are, are, are were accessible you know by 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 other means all right well so it's kind of interesting I don't know the precise result for PGLN but uh, I might imagine I can imagine that you have some result for Brouwer group because so much is known for Brouwer groups and uh, then probably you can get PGLN from Brouwer groups, but I don't know of a statement. So I okay. doubt you get any new statement for, for the Brouwer groups, but I will check. No, but you know, this, this is a Brouwer group of RF, not of R. So that's a, I, I don't know, okay. So there is something, uh, well, the purity of Brouwer groups is known and I assume that this is uh, uh, maybe you can derive it from the purity for Brouwer groups. I don't know. Be, well, okay. I'll check. The, 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 that could be interesting to see whether, you know, with knowledge and Brouwer group and this bad what they call Rao business give, gives uh, an element, I mean, a simpler proof of, uh, I mean, I, I will say in a, Yes, uh, 30 years uh, old. <laughs> I mean, a proof of the 90s, of the 80s, about what you have done. Okay. I see. In okay, that okay, case, yeah, I don't I'll know. Look it up. I'll look it up. Yeah, by the way, maybe I should mention that um, you get a certain statement for higher cohomology groups um, when G is abelian, because the functors also satisfy this, uh, this kind of properties. And it's proved in my paper that uh, if G is abelian, that you get some sort of uh, a similar statement for high homology group. I don't know if, if it's very innocent. So does that give you something for, for the Brouwer group then? Uh, yes, so you can certainly get a statement for the Brouwer group. Uh, and I think it is in my paper because uh, you have a statement for any, uh, maybe group of multiplicative type, in particular for GM, uh, but Again, I doubt it is new. Okay, so more questions? If not, then let's thank a speaker. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. <laughs>